Welcome to Windows in Time, Connections Across Landscapes, Building Stories Out of Bones. I am oh, presented by Jackson County Library Services. Um, I am Leah Pastizo, Digital Services Specialist. And this program is being recorded once again. Um, once again, please <laughs> uh, mute your microphone and turn off your camera. And <clears throat> there will be time to answer your questions at the end of the program. Jackson County Library Services acknowledges that its libraries are located within the traditional lands of the Shasta, Tekelma, and Ngatgawa people, whose descendants are now identified as members of the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians and, the, and Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, as well as the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians and Modoc Nation, who were forced to relocate to Oklahoma. The result of forced relocation and genocide is that Jackson County is no longer a population center for these specific tribal groups. As of the 2020 census, 4.6% of the population of Jackson County has some indigenous heritage. While this is more than twice the national average, it is a precipitous reduction from the pre-colonial 100%. We acknowledge that indigenous groups are too often relegated to the historical past when, in truth, indigenous people are essential members of the Jackson County community. We take this moment to recognize the indigenous peoples whose traditional homelands and hunting grounds are where residents of Jackson County live today. We encourage you to learn about the land you reside on and to join us in advocating for the inherent sovereignty of indigenous people. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. Today's presenter is archeologist Katie Johnson. Katie Johnson is a staff archeologist at the Southern Oregon University Laboratory of Anthropology, where she has been working in the Rogue Valley for more than a decade. Thank you, Katie, for being with us today. Okay, for those of you who, uh, who know me, you know I am not Katie Johnson. I'm Alice Mullally and I am part of the Southern Oregon Historical Society, co-sponsors with the public library system of this series. And we welcome both our live audience and those of you who are viewing uh, via Zoom. Uh, I wanted to just mention that um, something that's happening at the Historical Society right now is that um, many, many things are being added to our indexes online. So if you have in the past looked for something at the Southern Oregon Historical Society Research Library, it may not have been on an index and it may now be, so you might want to check back periodically. The library is also open. It's at 106 North Central in Medford. It's also open Tuesday through Saturday from noon to four. So you're welcome to come in and, and uh, research your family, your home, your business. Um, we have a huge, um, huge reservoir of historic papers. Um, in the library archives and photographs, 100,000 photographic images. Okay, so as, uh, as Leah mentioned before, Katie Johnson is our speaker from the Southern Oregon University uh, Laboratory of Anthropology, which some of us just call SULA, um, and is close to getting her master's degree in a field called Zoo. Zo Zo archaeology. Uh, thus, she looks at a lot of bones uh, that are found in archaeological sites and is going to share with us some of the things that uh, she has learned from that and can be learned from that. So let me turn it over to Katie. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let me get my screen shared for the online folks here. What's up? 
Okay, so a little bit different being in person and online. I'm trying to like look in two places at once here. Um, so I'm Katie. And um, the project that I am working on is part of a, the larger Chinese diaspora project that um, we as an organization have been partnering with other organizations throughout Oregon to work on. Um, part of this project was also funded by the Oregon State Parks Heritage Grant uh, funnel analysis or the bone animal bones from uh, archaeological sites. The analysis is very intricate and takes a lot of time to um, do well so you can say something about them and so um, we often have to look for outside funding to be able to complete that and so um, the heritage grant is what funded this okay so the settlement of the american west is a captivating subject uh, however many aspects of this have been gleaned over or simply ignored including the immense importance um, non-european populations played in its settlement and development Chinese immigrants are one population that is often omitted in America's history. Uh, the Chinese immigrants who came to America in the 19th century were subject to substantial barriers in the form of anti-Chinese legislation, um, racism, and violence. I've got like a funky bar on my screen here. So over the past 30 years, um, scholars have been uh, attempting to correct this omission of Chinese people from America's history. Um, they've done this through the development of Asian American and Chinese diaspora studies. And recent studies have uh, been attempting to move beyond site level and um, extending the scope of research across not only social and political boundaries, but across continents to try and truly understand what it meant to be Chinese America, uh, a Chinese American in the 19th century. The utilization of transnational and diasporic models have acted to shift scholarly approaches, helping researchers to move outside of national perspectives that while unintentional, often reinforce antiquated stereotypes and systems of oppression. Uh, diasporic models highlight the movement of people across the landscape, the connections that are formed in each location, and the networks that remain intact throughout the process. So the utiliza utilization of a diasporic model has helped to advance the field into new directions, allowing researchers to engage in broader discussions of human migration and global connections. And by moving the focus away from the individual sites, um, comparisons, that once do dominated the interpretations and instead to models of connectivity across space and time, we begin to understand individual sites within this broader context of immigration. Next, go to the next slide. Okay, so the Chinese had a long history of immigration documented to as early as the seventh century with immigration in the tens of thousands by the 1600s. Uh, this large scale immigration from Southeast uh, Eastern China beginning in the 19th century to locations around the world, including North America is documented as one of the most important population movements in modern history. So during this period, um, over two and a half million Chinese are documented as immigrating to locations around the world. Uh, the majority of the Chinese immigra immigrants who came to North America were from the Pearl River Delta in southeastern China within the Guangdong province, and that's what's highlighted on the map there. Uh, the significance of this location is tied to the tree port of Guangzhou, um, which is now Canton, as well as Hong Kong and Macau. Uh, these ports, in contrast to others in China, had a long history of trade and export with non-Chinese. Um, as a result, this region was exposed to non-Chinese people and manufactured goods in greater quantities than others um, outside of the area, and likewise facilitated the export of goods and the immigration of people um, from this region on a much larger scale. So in the narrative of the American settlement, uh, Chinese migrants have often been betrayed as poor, destitute, and unskilled refugees. Uh, however, China and Guangdong specifically had a long history in the skilled labor market. So while gold may have drawn the Chinese immigrants to the west coast of the United States, um, factors associated with the economic and social climate of China during this period um, would have provided additional incentive for immigration. 
Uh, some of these in factor, factors included war, rebellion, famine, and economic depression. The immigration of the Chinese to America and other locations around the world uh, was a strategy uh, to improve one's personal and social economic standing, provide stability, and to seek new opportunities in the same manner as other um, immigrant populations. So a key element of the Chinese culture which impacted their experience in America is the participation in intricate kinship based networks, which often coordinated their initial travel from China and then integrated them into existing communities and work groups upon their arrival. Uh, villages and kinship networks played an extensive role in the opportunities for the immigrants and often provided the money connections and motivation for travel to the United States. In turn, the Chinese in America supported families and communities back in China. Um, there were also Chinese labor contractors and cultural institutions uh, who were already in the United States and um, would often pay to bring Chinese laborers to them and then would sponsor um, workers from the same family or community uh, over long periods of time. So individuals would then continue to draw on these existing networks for support long after any contractual agreements were um, over. So this system of continued integration into the home community of China while negotiating the social and economic networks of the host community in America created a transnational identity that spanned continents and is what lies at the heart of the Chinese diasporic studies. Uh, so these continued ties had profound effects on not only the Chinese immigrants, but the home villages where they came from. So once in America, the Chinese experience was not homogenous. Factors such as where they were located in relation to um, uh, Ch larger Chinese communities and urban centers and what industries they were working in would have impacted the choices that the individuals made on a daily basis. Chinese immigrants were primarily employed in the mining, railroad, fishing, and logging industries. However, there were also a fair number of um, merchants who would have provided services to um, Chinese as well as non-Chinese clientele as well. And then we have Chinese launderers, cooks, housekeepers, and doctors documented in settings across the West Coast of America in both rural and urban context. So the Chinese migrant experience is visible within the archaeological record from a variety of sightings. So um, for my research, I have selected Jacksonville, um, the Chinese border in Jacksonville, which is a rural site in Southern Oregon. Um, and although it is located in what today we would consider a rural setting, it was um, once considered the central hub of the region prior to being bypassed by the railroad in 1888. Uh, so Jacksonville was first settled in the 1850s after the discovery of gold in Daisy Creek. And the location of the town is at the intersection of um, the Applegate Trail, the Oregon, California Trail, and the road to the coast, which put it um, as a central hub of 19th century travel in the region. Um, so Chinese immigrants came to Jacksonville for the same reason as immigrants from around the world, gold. Um, Chinese communities were established on the heels of European mining communities within California and Oregon. Uh, the town of Jacksonville was no different. And by the 1860s, um, the Chinese Quarter was firmly established along Main Street in Jacksonville. So we excavated the Chinese Quarter site in 2005 under the direction of Chelsea Rose. And this site represents a house that burned down on September 11th in 1888. So um, fire suppression efforts targeted other areas in Jacksonville that were on fire. And this portion of the community was left to burn. And then afterwards, it was simply capped by Phil, creating a time capsule of late 19th of the late 19th century community. So the excavations revealed thousands of artifacts related to the daily lives of the inhabitants, from dishes to clothing, um, gaming pieces, food storage containers, coins, and personal items, in addition to 49 pounds of food-related animal bones. Uh, this site represents one of the earliest Chinese communities within Oregon, if not the earliest, that's been archaeologically excavated. And um, it provides valuable information regarding the daily lives of the Chinese migrants in rural settings of Oregon.
Um, additionally, the abundance of cultural materials recovered from the site, including the food-related bones, allows for site comparisons across contexts and the incorporation of broader discussions related to the Chinese diaspora of Oregon and the West Coast. So for my research, I've specifically focused on the animal food remains recovered from the site in Jacksonville. Um, what we eat goes far beyond simple sustenance. Food is a cultural construct um, and has the ability to create and maintain social relationships and boundaries. Uh, food can be used to define or maintain and change social, st social status and as a means to integrate into a host community or to maintain ties to one's home as transnational identities are ne negotiated. Food choices made by an individual or group can index how they are navigating economic, social, and environmental constraints. Mm -hmm. And the compromises that are made through the process, um, refer, which is referred to as localization. Researchers focusing on food ways have found that a broader approach is needed to fully comprehend the meaning behind and the pressures associated with the changes that occur in food choices among not only Chinese migrants, but um, other migrant populations in general. So as with the analysis of non-food items, um, research related to food practices has often focused on the shift that occurs versus the continuity, continuity of what is deemed a traditional food choice. This has created a false spectrum with two distinct, pull, distinct poles, um, resulting in the portrayal of the Chinese migrant population as rigid and unchanging due to the preservation of Chinese material and food practices. Um, likewise, the characterization of Chinese related food items as exotic um, have perpetuated these linear models of assimilation and act to underplay the diversity of the Chinese migrant population and their individual experiences. So in an attempt to move beyond these simplified interpret, um, interpretations of assimilation, researchers have to consider the diversity as, of what is deemed traditional food um, as what's being transported and imported from distant, distant markets would have reflected a very small portion of the overall food being utilized in China. Uh, transported foods would have had been selected for based on ease of transportation. Um, so they had to be dried in bulk and sent over. So what we see um, is a very small representation of the diverse food waste present across China. Um, in addition to export markets, the social and political atmosphere of the period have to be considered um, as anti-Chinese legislation and racism were abundant in the late 19th and early 20th century, which could have restricted purchasing options for the Chinese migrant population. And of course, we have to consider per aspects of personal choice um, and the use of food ways to create, maintain, and define one, one's identity. Okay, so my specific re research question for this project um, has been, or, or is, <laughs> how um, the food-related bones from the Jacksonville Chinese Quarter inform our understanding of the movement of goods and the materials to and from the 19th century site. And this leads into more questions after questions, um, <laughs> such as, um, can we see how and if the food choices being made by the Chinese migrants of the site were impacted by the accessibility of late 19th century markets in relation to not only the geographical location, but also the social and economic atmosphere of the period? And how are these impacting agents visible in the assemblage? Um, we can also look at how consumer choice re is represented in the assemblage from the site. Um, what types of choices being made are visible in the assemblage? And what do these choices represent in regards to the inhabitants' personal preferences, identity, and social and economic status within not only the Chinese migrant community, but in uh, the larger host community? So what we have. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, the analysis of the faunal the food related bones was um, partially paid for by the heritage grant from the Oregon State Parks and Recreation Department. The initial analysis was conducted in 2017, although um, every time I look at the bones, I learn more and figure out more. So it's been a continued process over five years. <laughs> um, the assemblage contained almost 18,000 individual bones that were recovered from the site. And these are represented by 
um, wild game, including deer, pheasant, um, bear, and cougar. Domesticated specimens that could have been raised on site, such as pigeon, chicken, or duck, um, and other domesticated um, animals that could have been raised locally or imported from a larger market. And these included um, pork, beef, and sheep and goat. Sheep and goat are really hard to tell apart bones, so we just group them. Um, and then um, items were also imported from the West Coast uh, of the US. And then we had items imported specifically from China. Okay, so mammal made up the largest um, portion of the identified specimens. Um, which with around 8,500. So we had um, specimens that were identifiable to cow, uh, pig, bear, cougar, sheep or goat, and then deer. And so um, the picture in the top left is um, actually an image from the excavation. You can see there's a little pile of pig mandibles. On the top right is an image from a uh, uh, modern market in China um, selling pig. That's actually a market. And then the um, specimens on the bottom are all cleaned up um, representations of what it looks like to go through the bones. <laughs> um, so while both Euro-American and Southern um, Chinese preparation methods are visible within the assemblage, um, the quantity of meat present does not represent what is often considered a traditional rural Chinese cuisine, where meat would have been eaten on um, rare occasions and celebrations. So um, it may also be the case that many of the bones present had been processed down through the drying and salting of the meat or to just the bone for additional marrow processing, uh, which would have, would have reflected a much lower mass than if the bones retained their initial pre-processed size and weight. You can imagine 49 pounds of bones would take up a lot of space <laughs> if you had the whole thing on it. So. Um, an interesting element of the pork assemblage was the abundance of pig mandibles. So we had um, 111 fragments of mandibles, but we were able to dis, dis, um, identify 11 of, them, um, 11 of them as left portions of the mandible and 11 is right. So we can say that we had at least 11 mandibles present. Um, so uh, of the mandibles, all of them had been um, cut at the ascending, cut or chopped at the ascending ramus. So where the, man, or the mandible comes up and turns and to connect to the jaw. And you can see in that picture how they, they're chopped. And then um, all but two had been caught, cut laterally at the chin. Um, so this is actually related to um, marrow processing. And while it's not specific to Chinese cuisine, it shows a distinct method of use at the site. Uh, meat and bone broth make up a significant portion of the historical and contemporary Chinese diet. Um, the most abundant marrow deposits occur within the long bones and mandibles of mammals, including pigs. And modern experiments conducted on modern pig populations um, have, uh, pig heads have suggested that the distinct chopping seen on the mandibles here from the Chinese quarter site are the result of marrow extraction rather than meat recovery. So um, additionally, there were large mammals, mostly probably cow, um, and these are generally sawn rather than seeing the chopping like we see with the pork. There was a much smaller amount identified to this um, group, but um, the identified uh, elements are also um, elements associated with um, broths or stews. Okay, so the bird made up the second largest portion of the assemblage, um, which is over 7,000 individual bones. Um, we identified duck or goose, again, very similar, so it's hard to tell the difference, um, chicken and pigeon. So although by count the birds represent um, a smaller portion of the assemblage, birds actually have a higher um, meat to bone ratio, which would indicate that the bird actually outweighs the mammal in relevance at the site. Um, so chicken and duck are traditionally made, uh, traditionally made up a large portion of the Southern Chinese diet. Um, and while chicken is generally eaten fresh, duck is eaten both fresh and preserved. And then the whole carcass is preferred because um, there's culinary uses for the head to the feet, all of it. Um, so a large portion of the Bertus image showed evidence of being chopped as a preparation method. 
And additionally, there were um, almost over a thousand um, individual little fragments of eggshell. <laughs> um, and that's just a sample. Eggshell is really hard to collect because it just disintegrates. Um, and it's not identifiable to species. Uh, but we know that um, chicken, duck, and pigeon eggs were commonly eaten, both fresh and preserved by Chinese migrants. Um, and the presence of the eggs, I mean, obviously they're eating them there. Um, so then, then within the assemblage, we also had um, leg bones of chickens that had what's called a medullary deposit. So this is a spongy deposit within the bone, and it's specifically um, related to egg laying hens. So the presence of it within our assemblage indicates that um, chickens were being raised on site, not only for their egg production, but their meat as well. And then we also had gastroliths, um, which gastroliths are um, anything that the chicken eats, they eat like rocks. Um, we had, there was porcelain glass, little pieces of stuff and they eat it and then uh, it's stored in their gizzard and it helps them digest their food. So then when you butcher them, you get these little, um, pieces of glass and stuff that are polished and water worn looking and those end up in the archaeological record indicating that um, chickens are being raised on site. Okay, then we had fish. Um, so fish represents by count a smaller um, portion of the assemblage, but we still had quite a bit and we were able to identify 13 different species um, represented in three different resource groups. So we had freshwater fish, which mm -hmm. included salmon and Sacramento perch. So while the salmon could have been obtained from the local rivers of the region, the Sacramento perch would have been imported from freshwater fisheries in California in a salted or dried form. An interesting aspect of this assemblage is that while a variety of freshwater fish species could have been obtained locally and are often seen within archaeological records within the region. Um, local fish are really not represented within the assemblage. There was only a few salmon present. So this could speak to the personal preferences of the inhabitants of the site. Uh, we then had the marine fish. Um, we had surf perch, kelp greenling, pile perch, rockfish, and California sheephead identified within the assemblage. And all of these specimens would have been obtained from fisheries along the West Coast and then um, brought to San Francisco or Portland and then imported to Jacksonville. And then we had our imported Asian fish species. So we had Chinese white herring, uh, yellow croaker, large yellow croaker, thread fin breams, and cuttlefish. It's important to note cuttlefish is not a fish, it's a cephalopod, but we group it into this category. Okay, so um, the importance of the Chinese fish, generally speaking, indicates the importance of continued relationships with the migrants and the home and commercial networks. So these links would not only have provided material and food, but also acted as a means of communication with larger Chinese communities, uh, both home and abroad. So in this sense, the importance of these networks as a means of maintaining community far outweighs the importance of the material culture that is transported through them. We also had some reptile and shellfish. Um, there wasn't a lot, but we were able to identify Western pond turtle, which is native to the West Coast here. Um, and then um, Asian soft shell tor turtle, which would have been imported. We also had some um, shellfish. The only one we were able to positively identify was the abalone, although um, there's other species present. We just haven't figured out what they are yet. Very small. <laughs> so where's it all coming from? So this is where we take the analysis beyond simply what's there. So um, for the mammal, in looking at the bones, we have evidence that Many have been chopped in what would be considered a traditional method with a cleaver. So rather than purchasing small cuts of meat um, from a local butcher, it's clear that they were processing the food themselves, although there is saw and bone present as well. So this um, was not the only method, and it could be that larger cuts of meat were being purchased and then cut down on site for preparation. Um, we also sent a sample of the bones off for isotopic analysis. So this type of analysis looks for carbon and nitrogen markers in the bones that are tied to the foods eaten while the animals were being raised and can then indicate um, which region they were raised in. And so from that, we were able to determine that 
of the samples sent off, the domesticated animal, animals that we have present um, were being raised in this local region rather than imported from outside sources. Um, we also did the isotopic analysis on the bear and determined that it was from this region. Um, and then we did DNA analysis. <laughs> so um, the DNA analysis done on the bear indicated it, it was black bear. So then we have two lines of evidence indicating that yes, it came from this region. And then the next step has been the historical evidence. So I've spent a lot of time at the Historical Society um, with Alice and Ben and <laughs> everybody looking through records to try and find um, references to transactions occurring between the Chinese population and the larger population in the region. So this is a little expert from the Diaries of Wellborn Beeson. And um, as you can see, he references that um, Chinaman Jim bought 42 head of hog. <laughs> so um, we have historical documentation that um, pork was being bought from local farmers. And not only that, but a lot of it. So 42 pigs were purchased at one time. And we have other references to smaller um, quantities being purchased. But so live hogs were being purchased by the Chinese. Um, Chinaman Jim is a pretty classic um, way to reference. We A lot of the records just reference Chinaman or um, you know, gin security or, you know, there, there's not great um, name, naming happening. <laughs> okay, so a little more into the um, historical documentation. So this is an excerpt from the Kubli store records and from Alexander Martin ledgers. Um, so one thing that I've noticed in going through all these letters is actually an absence of meat being sold. Um, the Kubli ledgers do reference pork and bacon one time, um, and then they reference saltfish, codfish, um, and um, canned oysters to her, so that, um, being sold. Other than that, we have a lot of dried goods. So um, most prevalent were salt, rice, flour, um, if the Chinese community is actually processing these hogs themselves, then salt would have been an important commodity because a lot of material is being um, dried and salted. An interesting little tidbit about the oyster. Um, there are three different types of oyster that could have been represented. Um, the first one is the um, oyster that was native to the, our west coast here, and it was actually exhausted by the 1850s through overfishing. So then the American oyster from the east coast is imported for cultivation, and it works kind of, but then kind of dies out. It doesn't, this doesn't end up being a great fit. And um, so then by the 1920s, the Japanese oyster actually is brought in for cultivation, and that's what you get today. Um, the Japanese oyster is actually a major export of Japan starting in the 1600s. And um, the imports would have been primarily canned through or preserved meat. So then you have to question if they're coming in canned, then why do we have the shells? Um, so generally the meat is removed from the shell. So the sh presence of the shell within the record might not indicate a food related source, um, but rather importation for other uses. Okay, so then this is probably my favorite picture. <laughs> um, this is the turtle farm out by Bybee Bridge by um, Tuville State Park. I don't know if you are all, all are familiar with it, but this is from 1898. So Western pond turtle was present in our assemblage and is present in a lot of assemblage and Western pond turtle is native to the West Coast up and down. Um, so um, the market for the Western pond turtle was established by the 1860s and is said to have replaced the diamondback turtle from the East Coast. Um, turtle is not specific to the Chinese, although um, the it is, turtle is referenced as an important food in China as well. So turtle was shipped um, to exclusive non-Chinese clubs, hotels, and restaurants up and down the West Coast. And in 1899, over 50,000 Western pond turtles were reported in markets across the West. Uh, and by the early 1900s, the, um, the turtle population actually declines, probably over um, use, and then um, so does the market. Okay, and then we have the abalone. So there wasn't really an abalone market before the Chinese came. 
um, but it's firmly established and significant by the 1860s. Um, it was supplying abalone to not only the Chinese communities in on the West Coast, but also being exported to China itself. Um, so the meat was removed from the shells and then um, dried, salted, and shipped to, brought into San Francisco and then sh shipped out from there. And then by the 1880s, uh, market is also developed for non-Chinese populations, or sorry, for um, the shell itself, and that's for Chinese and non-Chinese populations as well. And then by, again, by the early 1900s, California places all kinds of restrictions on the export of abalone and that uh, reduces the industry. Um, so as I mentioned with the oyster, the presence of the shell of the ab abalone in our archaeological record um, may not indicate a food source, but um, other food or other purposes coming in. Unless it was being imported whole over the railroad, which I'm not sure how fresh it would be at that point. So I haven't sat, seen any evidence of that, but I don't know if it'd be good. <laughs> um, okay, so then the next question is, how do we represent this information? So my research question was, I want to visibly see these networks and connections across the landscape. Um, and how do we do that in a meaningful way? Well, that's what I'm still working on. <laughs> um, I ran into some difficulties. Um, the first is finding direct connections to specific people. We don't know who was living at the site in Jacksonville um, at this point. And so that direct link is not present. Um, so rather than seeing, um, whoops, here we go. Um, so instead of a direct link, we're seeing more like a, a broader um, organization of movement of goods. So even though I show it as a direct link, it's not quite there. <laughs> um, another issue is that the food wasn't being shipped directly to Jacksonville. So we had um, it stopping multiple times along the way. And so it's hard to represent though that movement of goods and connections when it's, it's not just a direct connection. So, but this is what I'm coming up with. Um, <laughs> uh, so on a local level and then moving outwards, we have historical documentation of at least three individuals um, that reference food related transactions with Chinese populations. And that includes the Reams brothers, Alexander Martin and Pia Britt in Jacksonville. Um, we have salt, flour, rice, sugar, coffee, and tea documented as being purchased by the Chinese population. And then um, the chicken and birds, we are pretty sure that they're being raised on site. So then we move out a little bit more to the regional area. So here we have um, the Beeson farm, the Rapp farm, the, and the Ish farm, um, all referencing the sale of live hogs to the Chinese. Um, I have the turtle farm, which is just a picture, but I'm assuming that they could have gotten the turtle from there. They also could have just harvested it as a wild turtle. So it's hard to say, but we do have a turtle farm locally. So it makes sense that they could get turtle from there. We have the black bear, which from the DNA and isotopic analysis we know was obtained in this region. And then we have the few salmon samples and then um, eggs. So that I have one reference of eggs being sold to Chinese and otherwise we assume that they're being raised on site. So then this is where it gets a little tricky. So then we also have um, oyster, saltfish, codfish, rice, sugar, and salt being obtained from these regional markets, but are not available for production regionally. <laughs> so we know that that material, even though it's available in the regional markets was actually coming from outside of this area. And I don't know, um, so codfish, I don't know if that actually re references cod and the salt fish could reference any type of salted fish. So of the 13 species. I was. <laughs> okay, so then we move even broader to the West Coast. So we have San Francisco and Portland as our major um, exports to our region. Um, we have historical documentation indicating that materials were coming from both locations, not specifically one. And then um, we have the resources along the West Coast are specific to the West Coast, which would have been abalone, other shellfish, um, surf perch, kelp greenling, pile perch, drums, rockfish, and California sheephead. <laughs> 
and then transcontinental. So we have um, materials being imported from China and potentially Japan with the oyster. Um, we had the Chinese white herring, the yellow croaker, the large yellow croaker, th threadfin bream, cuttlefish, oyster, and then the Asian soft shell turtle. Um, I, this was again, not coming directly to Jacksonville as the picture kind of implies. Um, it would have gone to these larger markets in San Francisco and Portland and then been brought in from there. So overall, what we can see from this assemblage as, as is that this small population of Chinese people living in the rural community of Jacksonville, Oregon have extensive connections, not only within the local community, but across the West Coast and connections that span continents. Additionally, it's clear that an abundance of food was available in the local region, and yet ties to these larger markets and China were still maintained by choice. So this is blatantly different than the narrative of the Chinese immigrant population that has been presented in America's history and really speaks to the need to change this narrative. So this was not a poor destitute population, but a thriving and skilled population who were integral to the development of the American West and who were able to create and maintain extensive networks that helped them to thrive in the face of anti-Chinese legislation and racism. Okay, so we have a few next steps. Um, <laughs> one is potentially looking out the outward movement of material from Jacksonville. So we know from the amount of food present at the site, um, that more, it references more than simply one household or uh, one individual household, what they would consume. So we haven't been able to track down who specifically was living there. However, if they were a registered merchant, that would have been documented. So it's more likely that they were acting as peddlers, um, supplying food and material to the larger Chinese community of the region in an unofficial format. Um, so then the question is, is there a way to see the movement of goods outward from the site. So if they're not formally documenting the movement of the goods, then that's really hard. But that would be my hopes is that someday we would find documentation of not only movement of goods in, but movement of goods out. Um, the site assemblage can also be used for across site comparisons um, to other Chinese migrants, immigrant sites across Oregon and the West Coast um, to not only see how the individuals at the site we're negotiating life in a rural community of Oregon, but to see how the population on a broader scale was making choices and what were impacting those choices. Um, whoops, I don't know what I just did, sorry. Um, so another option would be to use this analysis and in a comparison to other migrant populations. Um, such as Peter Britt's home, <laughs> who lived just up the street. Um, so we were fortunate enough to excavate that property, I think in 2009 or 2010. Um, but again, because of the time and cost of doing an in-depth analysis, the funnel material hasn't been analyzed. But that's my next hope is that I can take these two immigrant populations, Peter Britt was Swiss German and then the Chinese, and they lived contemporary and just down the street and do a comparison to see how they were different or similar and if they're negotiating um, accessibility the same way. And then last but not least, additional analysis to try and really pin down the direct connections to these different markets. Um, so I'd like to give a special thanks to um, Tyler Davis, who has been an integral part of sorting through and identifying all of these bones. Um, like I said, there was almost 18,000 bones, it took a lot of time, and he was really helpful. Um, ben Truy has been awesome in helping me search through the records and sends me references anytime he comes across something um, that references um, food, being, uh, food transactions with the Chinese population. And then also to Jeff Leland, who um, 35 years ago was one of the first people to begin really critically thinking about the Chinese population of our region and the importance that they played in the settlement of the West. That's it. <laughs>